hello, my name is uh, Professor Henrietta Bowden Jones. I run the uh, National Center for Gaming Disorders, the first NHS center to treat gaming disorders in the UK. And I'm also the director and founder of the National Problem Gambling Clinic. And this was at its time of starting the first NHS clinic um, in the country to treat gambling disorder. I set it up in 2008. Uh, since starting it, um, we have about a decade after starting it, we have now the pleasure of having a further 15 NHS funded clinics being uh, developed throughout the country. Uh, the gaming clinic is one of them um, and the young people's gambling services that I also run here in London is another one. The rest are being set up uh, including the Leeds Clinic that has been running for some time all over the country. Um, I'd like to start by just giving an idea of, of, of why the, uh, the first clinic, the, the gambling clinic, began. And, um, and really to look at the national context at the time. It was around 2006, 2007, when the government was talking about the possibility of having um, a large super casino and lots of other casinos around the country being built. And the population was very anxious. They didn't know whether more casinos and a super casino would mean more people gambling. Uh, and indeed, whether more people gambling would mean more people presenting with a gambling disorder. And at that time, I happened to be in the position of being the spokesperson for the Royal College of Psychiatrists uh, on the subject. And so it was really through six months of intense uh, fielding of media calls uh, about this issue that I was first of all able to say well if you increase opportunities and increase availability you are highly likely to uncover more potential people who uh, experience problems and that's the same let's say if you talk about alcohol if you suddenly have twice as many people drinking alcohol you're bound to have some more people with an alcohol disorder being uncovered who may have not been drinking before and therefore would not have known that they had this issue as a vulnerability. Um, at the time, what was apparent to me was that here we were with very much the possibility of these super casino and the other casinos, which then didn't get built in the end, um, but we had nowhere to put the patients. And uh, I was in those years um, running an inpatient detox detoxification unit for drugs and alcohol disorders in central London. It covered, it was for central Northwest London NHS Trust that this remains my trust. And in those years, um, there were very severe NHS cases of addiction coming through, we would detox people and send them, you know, treat them and send them home. Um, and there was nothing of equivalence um, in outpatient setting or inpatient setting in the NHS for gambling. So that's what led to it. And when we started, it was very small. Uh, we were given money for a one year pilot. The money um, was clearly uh, not enough to deal with what we were dealing with. Um, we started small and within a few years, we were at 900 referrals a year. Um, now we run um, with a very strictly uh, commissioned basis so that we don't overly uh, we don't need to perform over and above the commissioning levels. You know, if I uh, am due to see uh, uh, and assess uh, 10 people a week in my clinic, that's what I will do. And this is a nice thing about having something that's run for so many years. But at the beginning, we had no idea, were there, a, were there people with gambling disorders in the country? There was no, you know, were they going to come forward? How many would come? And this was really how we, um, uh, we got started. So evidence base is at the core of anything that we do um, as a unit, 
and really in general how the NHS runs. So it was only through the following years as we had more and more people presenting that we realized we, we know here was the evidence we needed to treat people because the demand was there. Um, what we don't have in this country properly as yet, we don't have any proper prevalence survey on gaming disorder. And we have only a very, very old study, the British Gambling Prevalence Survey of 2010, um, showed us that just under 1% of people uh, were ex was experiencing a gambling disorder. And 2 million people were actually at risk of developing. They were already suffering harm. But since 2010, there hasn't really been another large study. And this is a big problem because we have no idea how the new uh, how the changes to the Gambling uh, Act of 2005, implemented in 2007, impacted on the population, on its gambling. We know the industry is making more and more money, but we don't really know how it's translating into how many people are experiencing harm. Uh, so that's a really big issue that we are trying to address by urging the government to have a, a new uh, and regular prevalence study for both gambling and gaming every couple of years. It needs to be wide enough because it's not a very high prevalence illness. If you don't look at a large enough population and if you don't look for the people in the right way, you won't find them. So prevalence surveys historically have always called people on home numbers. I think the gambling commissions one still does, which is why they never find any problem gamblers, because if you're a problem gambler, you always owe money. And if you owe money, you're never going to answer your phone, particularly not your home phone, but certainly also not your mobile to an unknown number. So you are, you know, there has to be a completely new way of assessing how to identify the correct prevalence uh, but that job does need to be done urgently we are in interesting times at the moment because as you know we are in the middle of the gambling review to try and digitalize the new uh, the, the new act so that it takes into account the fact that nearly everyone now is online gambling uh, hardly anyone's left in bookmakers Despite lockdown, even before lockdown, the rates were really dropping. And uh, just to give you an idea, when I started the gambling clinic, 80% of people were in bookmakers, 20% 20, 20 were online. Uh, by a year ago, it was the other way around. And now it's probably not even, you know, 5%. So, you know, we need to keep up with the times. And again, this is about evidence based. Um, we do research. Uh, at the clinic, and I also have a co-chair a group at Cambridge University, the National UK uh, Behavioural Addictions Group, and we try and understand what is happening in relation to gambling. We bring on experts, whether it's epidemiology, whether it's neurobiology, whether it's clinical work, so that we can improve the way we treat uh, this disease. Um, with the gaming, we are in a much uh, less evolved um, position because I only started the clinic in 2019, just before lockdown. And so although we are commissioned by NHS England to see 50 children or parents a year, we've already uh, uh, overshot that by 100% and we will be seeking more funds in order to do a better job. But we are a long way from doing the really sophisticated research um, that we, well, it's not really sophisticated in general terms because addictions is always lagging a bit behind, but it's certainly sophisticated enough to allow us to know the types of people who are gambling, uh, what their vulnerabilities are, neuroscientifically speaking, not, not just in terms of um, their behaviours. And we are nowhere near that with the gaming. Uh, but ultimately, the, the pleasure of running two national clinics for me is that we are able to conduct the best possible evidence-based treatment whilst consolidating any changes uh, uh, with research. And also we are tracking behaviors because behaviors change through time in the way that our gamblers were in bookmakers and now they're online. 
uh, you know, who is more likely to suffer harm from online gambling? What kinds of products are more likely through the structural characteristics to be harmful to specific patients? Equally, when you look at gaming, how old are these children? We thought we'd be seeing people in their late teenage years, early 20s, we're having referrals of people who are 10 or 11. We can't even treat them because we treat people from 13. So this is all very interesting. What types of games are they doing? Which children are more likely to steal their parents' credit cards in order to pay money on the games? Which children are going to be violent? We know that half of our children have been violent in the family, uh, either to parents or to belongings. Uh, we had no idea this was going to happen. Um, so all of these issues need to be unpacked. Um, when I talk about treatment, we use cognitive behavioral therapy treatment for both the gaming and the gambling uh, with good success, uh, better success even than the research studies that are warranting this treatment. But uh, as with all psychological interventions, not everyone benefits. And certainly at the National Problem Gambling Clinic, we also use naltrexone. And to use naltrexone, we had to uh, show enough evidence base was present uh, across the world to allow us to use it and to see how it would help our patients. And of course, we've realized, and we've now published case series on this, that for some people it's extremely helpful. Why exactly, with what it is in their DNA that is so, in, it's so responding to the naltrexone, that's not clear yet. But again, it's research for the future. Um, I've talked about patients, I haven't talked about families, and I'm very, very keen to talk about families, uh, parents and children. So the harm to parents in terms of the violence from um, the gamers is a really big thing. Um, the fragmentation of the families uh, because a child decides to spend time gaming rather than doing all the things he or she used to love, like their sports or going to the park with, the, with a parent or both parents and playing, you know, doing their hobbies. Uh, there is a lot of harm to siblings of people with addictions because they are ignored, neglected, uh, or they are actually terrified or anxious because of the behavior from the person with the addiction. So we try and work with the families at all times from the beginning. Um, with the gambling, the harm can be quite bad physically because we know there are really much higher rates of domestic violence towards wives and female partners, um, particularly in the past when banks weren't able to remove your expenditure on gambling because then wives would take on the management of the finances and then would be forced to hand over money. So that's a bit better now because since Monzo and other banks have introduced the gamble block, um, we encourage patients to put that on rather than to get anyone else to look after their cash. And that's reduced the tension. Um, but of course, violence can be towards older um, parents. And if we talk about children for a moment, you know, that is really one of the things that's closest to my heart because so many of the people I see were children of people with addictions. Their life was predetermined in a very awful way from the beginning by the anxiety and the harm. Um, and of course there was genetic loading as well, but puts, putting them at a, at a higher risk, but certainly the environment is the strong, strong, a predictor of things going wrong when people feel unsafe, anxious, unprotected, when they're not given the same emotional support and the same opportunities, particularly gambling when there is no money at all in the house or when they have to change home 20 times because their father's running away and then they change schools and then they get bullied and then their self-esteem issues occur, etc. So I'm very, very keen to do everything I can to support anyone who's doing any work in relation to children of people with addictions. So when it comes to women and gambling disorder, uh, we have seen an enormous amount of um, distress of low mood, of anxiety symptoms that are, were not just present before the addiction, but are a consequence of the addiction. There are, there's a lot of guilt, 
and there's a lot of self-esteem um, issue issues as well. And we are seeing women turn towards themselves. If we talk about violence, I don't regularly hear people getting beaten up by their wife because the wife wants the money. No, it's much more secretive than that. So here is a good example of how things, you know, gender is dictating somehow the behavior. But what I will tell you is in the last few years, I have seen an escalation of this severity of the suicidal ideation and intent and planning in our female gamblers. All of them appear to be, or the majority of them, appear to be intent on killing themselves, not only or so much because of the addiction, but because of the debts they've built up and because they're being chased by illegal money lenders and they're very, very frightened. They're frightened of either getting hurt or they're frightened of being found out and of losing their stability or their children or their spouse. And then they can't see a way out. And then they attempt to suicide in very nasty ways that have been uh, shocking and in a way, something that we had not come across, say even in maybe five or six years ago, we weren't seeing these cases. I think the internet has caused this by having, um, by, a speed of play by availability 24 seven. These are the women who may not have uh, gone off. You know, they wouldn't have gone to bookmakers. They may not have accessed online the same uh, level of gambling as they are doing now. So they are, they are, in a way, there's a leveling of gender equality there in a nasty way, where they're actually presenting us with very pathological gambling disorders. Um, so, so there is um, a violence that is turned against themselves. And then there is something about barriers to treatment in relation to women. We have always found it harder to draw women to treatment and to keep them in treatment. In the old days, when treatment was face to face, they would find it difficult to come because they had to drop off children, pick up children. Very often they were not uh, women with independent jobs, they were often relying on, um, uh, on husband's uh, incomes and disappearing for even half a day to come to London was extremely problematic. Um, so I thought that, you know, as the years went on, we would see more um, independent women who may be able to um, seek help from us uh, and and uh, come and give us their time without fearing about the consequences, but that is still not happening. So there is something cultural here about women right. and children and women and spouses that tie them to the home in a way that men are not presenting with. And that, you know that's got to be taken into account when we're looking at barriers. Overall though, I will say that the numbers are going up and there are some weeks when three out of 10 patients are female. And that is a long way from where we were when we often had whole weeks where no, no women were coming forward. So, you know, it's sad but it's good that it's happening because we know gambling addiction can impact on men and women. So to have women come forward means that less women are out there without being treated. There are a couple of things about growing up uh, with gambling. So we know from a lot of research internationally and nationally that if you have grown up with gambling in your family home, with your parents gambling, your grandparents gambling uh, around you, um, even if they were not problem gamblers, uh, you are more likely to be a problem gambler. And equally, we know that if you have parents who are problem gamblers, again, you are more likely to be a problem gambler. And th so there's, th there is the environmental pressure, or not pressure, but influence, and there is the genetic influence. But having said this, um, we also know that in England, um, many, many people gamble. And um, I think the most important thing has been uh, starting this new, starting the clinic when I did in 2008, to accept that a bit like 
a lot of people drink alcohol, you can be there to treat alcohol disorders while not being against drinking alcohol. Okay, so, so there is one thing to say, protect your children. Do not gamble in front of your children. Do not encourage your children to place bets and gamble for you. Um, I don't mean gamble for you because that's illegal now, but you know what I mean, choose your bets and then you put them on for your children. Because that can, uh, in a very small minority of people, trigger what is a dysregulated reward pathway functioning that, that might set them on the wrong path early on, um, finding the gambling far too exciting and chasing it in future life. Um, once they're older and in their mid twenties, their brains are more protected and they're gonna be less impulsive and they will automatically be less at risk if then, you know, uh, after school days, they come across people gambling. It's gonna have a different emotional and generally uh, uh, impulsivity wise, a different strength of impact. So that's important for people uh, you know, to know about. Um, you asked me um, earlier on about the way the NHS handles uh, gambling disorder and the way I see things developing and gaming. Well, um, the di digitalization of treatment has meant, uh, and this is to our uttermost surprise because before lockdown, we had no idea this was gonna go this way, but it has meant that uh, people have found it a lot easier to receive help. They have found it easier to come forward, to attend appointments, to attend the initial assessment, not to miss appointments, and therefore to really do well in treatment. Because in the past, you know, if you're a gambler, you can't, you know, you often lose the money that you were supposed to spend on your ticket to come to London, or you've got three jobs because you're repaying your debts and you can't take time off to come to your treatment. Uh, or no one knows you've got a problem. How can you disappear every week to go and have treatment? So suddenly all this is sorted. And we have been delighted with this. And now as the head of the clinic, I'm thinking of just carrying on digitally because it makes perfect sense for this illness. With the gamers, very different. They're young, you know, uh, most of them are under 18, um, the ones we see. Uh, they would have needed a parent to come with them to London, who then would have had to take time off their job. Uh, most of the, many, many of the children we see are in, in one parent family. So again, you know, there'll be other siblings who would need to do without their parent because one is coming to London. So again, here, and also these gamers are often unwilling to leave the home because they are so tied to their bedrooms where they do the gaming. So in this case too, we see things being digital still after lockdown. And in both cases, I do believe uh, that the NHS is the correct place to treat them. It doesn't mean uh, we don't work with uh, charities, we do, we love working with charities, uh, we just take the more complex cases from their hands while they deal with a bigger population and the at-harm people and that seems to work very well. I strongly believe that if gambling um, was illegal until 21, uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, but I would say that because, of course, I see, you know, I see the fallout from uh, these cases. But I think that the number of the high numbers that we've seen of, of young people at university who didn't graduate because of the gambling. And I don't think they would have done it if it had been illegal. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, just in basing it on the young people, the football, the sports influence and the young people at university heading to casinos, uh, losing their money for the term. Um, you know, I, as I was saying earlier, the older you are, the less impulsive, and particularly at this young age, um, I, you know, for me, it would make perfect sense uh, to make, you know, to, to raise the age. Um, although I haven't been involved in any discussions on that, nor have I ever been asked. Uh, so this is the first time I'm discussing the 21-year-old the issue. Um, currently, there is a big issue around the confluence between gaming and gambling. And when we talk about young people and impulsivity uh, and uh, how able young children are, young people are to determine um, the extent of their involvement 
with specific gambling-like activities, the biggest problem has been around loot boxes. Now, there are countries in Europe uh, that have already banned loot boxes for young people uh, because the minute you regulate it as a gambling product, it then can't be done by children. Uh, what we know is that there are some children who are very uh, specifically excited by loot boxes and they are the reason they are taking their parents money um, is exactly for that reason they are taking the parents card in order to spend money and i've had patients who spent two thousand pounds a thousand pounds you know in short spaces of time uh, in order to um, spend money on these loot boxes and the gambling commission is reviewing whether right now they should follow suit in terms of other european countries and regulate these loot boxes and and you know the majority of people who know about gambling in relation to um, a public health approach uh, would tell you that they should be regulated uh, if we move on to schools for a second because this is often a question that get, i get asked um, uh, it is true that some young people are gambling. Um, so to ignore the issue completely uh, may not be a very good idea. It's like saying, well, only some people are using illegal drugs, so we'll ignore it. No, it's better to talk about it. But how you give your talk about gambling, that, that's important. Um, I don't like people who go into schools and talk about uh, this is the way you should gamble if you're going to gamble. No, I like people who go in and say, don't gamble. There is no reason why you should be gambling. Enjoy the sport, watch the sport, don't gamble. And I think that's a, you know, a source of tension, let's say, between different factions in the UK who are going into schools discussing um, gambling education in schools. What we do know is that you know, a year ago, oh, the Gambling Commission gave us about uh, statistics telling us that roughly 50,000 children were already problem gamblers with you know hundreds of thousands more gambling regularly um, this year um, uh, when we received the statistics from the year before it was up to 62,000 children so are, are we seeing a, a regular increment in the numbers of children who are gambling in a disordered way uh, well, it looks that way to me from what we've seen. Of course, you know, you could argue there's a confidence inter interval, you could uh, issue, you could argue that it's a methodological issue, which potentially it could be because, you know, you can't extrapolate from one or two schools and say the whole country is experiencing this. It would have to be uh, replicated on a much larger scale. But what we do know is that certainly there are children with gambling problems and children should not be gambling. Um, so I think society has a really big duty uh, in relation to removing gambling uh, stimuli from sporting environments, stadiums, football shirts, uh, television and uh, social media, uh, because children get to see that. And this is how you normalize a behavior that is not uh, child friendly. There are charities doing really good work. The Big Step has been campaigning to remove uh, gambling adverts from football. Uh, gambling with Lives has been very vocal. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're doing very good, good work on this. In an ideal world, I would like to see independent funding for high quality research. And independent, I mean, uh, uh, coming uh, from bodies that are not linked to the gambling industry or coming from a, uh, an independent body that has been funded with a statutory levy. Uh, nothing wrong with having a 1% levy, that's what people are talking about now, and then you give the money to the Medical Research Council or to the NHS, whoever you want to set up these big research uh, centers in order for us to understand gambling disorder and gaming disorder in the way uh, that we are understanding other physical and mental illnesses. There is a parity of esteem that gambling has not been treated fairly about. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's about understanding the issues 
in order to protect the population. I'd like to see a public health approach to gambling and gambling harm, which does mean uh, making sure that the public are not harmed by gambling, which means that affordability checks, probably the biggest word is affordability. What's happening now is that a large percentage of profits for the industry come from a very small minority of people who are spending too much, who are spending unhealthily. And we um, need to prevent that. So people can still spend if they want, uh, but they spend money they can afford to lose. And this entails uh, large data sharing by industry in order for uh, the right people. Uh, there's got to be a communication between the industry and the banks so that people who only earn £2,000 a month don't spend it all in one night. Um, and, and, and to be, you know, really, this is what happens to the people I see is that they're spending everything they've got on payday and then they've got nothing for the rest of the month. So affordability checks are vital. Uh, there are, so the statutory levy is the other, of course, uh, an evidence-based treatment approach so that you only fund treatment centers that are providing evidence base about the outcomes so that you don't waste money. Um, so that's very important. The independent research funding um, and an ombudsman. I think probably my second really big ask uh, um, after the affordability would be someone who can redress some of the injustice that so many people have suffered. Uh, in relation to their gambling losses. Uh, so that needs to happen. And now that the Gambling Commission is having to be, uh, uh, let's say, overhauled, um, in, in, uh, court, you know, because as you know, things are changing as we speak, um, then I do believe that there is a remit for bringing in someone who can properly run a fair system and ensure that accountability on the part of the industry is a key factor 